Yeah, hello everyone and welcome to this new episode of Pacific Talks Season 2. In this podcast, I engage in active conversations with my guests to talk about global challenges through a Pacific perspective. This is the last part of my conversation with Lord Fusitua, during which we discuss NFTs and their role in land management in the Pacific, as well as how we can envision those technologies as positive disruptors of our institutions in the context of Polynesian culture. So now, on to the third and final part of my conversation with Lord Fusito. I'd like to talk about another element that is quite important uh, when we talk about blockchain, but also when mm -hmm. we talk about our cultures, uh, Polynesian cultures. And, and you mentioned that yep. recently when you uh, attended the Island Finance Forum, it's the role that NFTs, uh, which are booming now in, in many regards, yep. can play in uh, land management. And we know how important land is for our Pacific people. And we also know that we are all struggling throughout the region to maintain ownership, to keep track of land titles, and, and eventually to guarantee that yeah. our lands remain the foundations of our communities. Yeah. So in that context, how do you envision NFT as an efficient tool to participate in, in solving this uh, core issue of our, our communities? Um... Well, that's the thing. See, Tonga's a, a very unique case in that Tonga, um, it was actually the other guy that talked about NFTs being used for land. Mm. I talked about blockchain being used for land mm. um, because you can have an immutable uh, land registry, one that's transparent and immutable. In Tonga, uh, it's illegal to sell land. There is no freehold land. Mm. So Tongans can't sell land to foreigners and Tongans can't sell land to each other. The only way you become owner of a piece of land is by inheritance. So in the Tongan constitution, every male who reaches the age of 16 automatically qualifies for a free quarter acre of land in an urban area to live on and a free eight acres of land in a rural area to farm on, completely free mm. from the state. So in, well, it's, it's from the state, but it's effectively from the king and the nobles because the land is ours. Mm. So by law, as soon as you're 16, you turn up to the Ministry of Lands, you say, I filled out my land grant form, here it is. I want my quarter acre so I can go and build my house and I want my eight acres so I can go and farm. And by law, it has to be given to you, yeah? So because our land tenure system is geared entirely around um, succession, the NFTs aren't of great utility to us because there cannot be competing claims to the land because uh, succession is very definitive. In our Land Act, it has an extremely detailed formula. Uh, the land is owned by A, and when A dies, it goes to B. If there is no B, it goes to C. If there is no C, it goes to D or DD. And if no DD, it goes to D. So it traces down all the possible permutations that could occur, and it's already provided for in our Land Act. So the bottom line principle is it has to go through the oldest legitimate male line. So the piece of land, the oldest legitimate, meaning that the issue of a marriage, not an illegitimate uh, child, uh, the oldest legitimate male who is connected by blood, the closest to the previous owner gets the land, yeah? So if you turn the land into NFTs, the fact that it's an NFT and can be safeguarded as your personal property is not applicable in Tonga because land is not personal property in Tonga. Mm. 
Land is uh, what's called in law real property. Mm -hmm. So uh, in law, real estate uh, is called real property. Chattels are called personal property. Uh, but you can still have land as personal property. In Tonga, land is actually real property because mm -hmm. you can't will land. So if you die, you can't will your land to your nephew. By law, it goes to your eldest male son. Mm -hmm. He can, by law, come and t when you die, that land goes to him, no ands, ifs, or buts. So because land is it's called an inalienable asset, mm -hmm. meaning it's an asset you cannot alienate from yourself by choice. Only the law can alienate it from you. So the use of NFTs are not so relevant, but the use of a blockchain is because then it's useful. Blockchains are useful for tracing a line of descent. So when you have lineages that cannot be tampered with, mm -hmm. that is, that is um, practical for our use case purpose. So once the, the bloodline is set on the blockchain, mm -hmm. you can't have people coming back trying to tamper with it to pretend that, they, that their great-great-grandparents were in fact married when they weren't mm -hmm. because that is a, a determining factor. If they were married, then you are the issue of a, a legitimate ancestor, therefore you have a right to land. If they were not married, you are the, the descendant of an illegitimate ancestor, therefore you have no right to the land. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So, yeah, not NFTs so much, but mm. the blockchain. Yeah, that's uh, definitely a, a, use, yeah, that's uh, a use case. Yeah, to certify. Yeah, especially um, with us, you're right. With mm -hmm. cult indigenous cultures have a connection to land, I had um, a GoPac. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm chairman for Oceania, uh, but we've got so we have Asia, Oceania, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Our Africa chapter, we had reports of um, the chairman of Africa having to do uh, intervene in some anti corruption work there. A, a particular blockchain, which shall remain nameless, mm -hmm. which is often associated with altruistic uh, uh, pro, uh, activities, is putting um, one of these countries, African countries' uh, land registry on a blockchain. Mm. So same argument. It's good. putting it on a blockchain is going to make it much more transparent and hard to tamper with. Yeah. The problem is, as with all blockchains, you're dependent on the paper source that the blockchain's taken from mm. not being contaminated first. Because if the paper registry is contaminated, then all you're doing is making something contaminated, contaminated forever, because it's going to be immutable. Yeah. If it's a paper paper registry and it's contaminated you can amend it down the line when you find when you brought new evidence that shows the contamination so a certain minister in this country had appropriated other people's lands as his own just before it was going to go on the blockchain and change the land registry for mm. it to reflect that he or his associates or their companies own this land and uh, I had by coincidence I had heard about it because um, I'd met a young man on a Bitcoin room on Clubhouse uh, and he had uh, lived in America since 2000 he and his mother had walked across North and Africa walked across Europe, uh, walked across uh, all the way, uh, got on a boat to New York. Mm. So they walked across two continents, got to New York, built a new life for themselves, 
and the mother's dying wish, this was 2000, 2022, the mother's dying wish was to go back and get her family land and build a house on it. The son had made enough to do so. Uh, they went back and they'd been in touch with the land registry. The land was all sorted. They get back to Africa and the minister has appropriated their land and it's now going on the blockchain as his land and not hers. So, yeah, there is also that danger. The which they need to up, clean up yeah. all the registries before. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You have to be very stringent with your source material because yeah. once it's on, it's on. So mm -hmm. you'll remember in the island forum, we did bring that up mm. that, uh, yeah, there are cases where uh, nefarious activities have occurred just before committing to the blockchain. So you have to be super, super um, careful and judicious and cautious mm -hmm. to make sure you do your due diligence before it gets uh, recorded to the blockchain. All right. Uh, so at this stage of the podcast, what I usually like to do is to, to read a quote from a book or an article that I've read uh, mm -hmm. relevant to the topic and to kind of have great minds collide through uh, spoken words. Wow. Uh, nice. And so for you, I chose, obviously, I went into the world of, of blockchain and I chose a, a, a <laughs> blog post from uh, Vitaly Buterin, uh, the founder of Ethereum. <laughs> and, uh, right. Yeah, and at the end of a, of a paper, a recent paper he published, he says this, uh, 21st century digital democracy through real-time online quadratic voting and funding could plausibly do a much better job than 20th century democracy, which seems in practice to have been largely characterized by rigid building codes and obstruction at planning and permitting hearings. And of course, if you're, doing to, if you're going to use blockchains to secure voting, starting off by doing it with fancy new kinds of votes, seems far more safe and politically feasible than refitting existing voting systems. So beyond the economic aspect of blockchain that we talked a lot uh, in the, our right. conversation, we can see that there's a potential for huge impact on our social and political systems. So in your own strategy for Tonga, uh, do you envision blockchain as also a way to evolve the institutional process of the country? Do you have any plan for that or, or do you really stick to some economical approach? Um, well, it depends. You really have to measure it out in the use case. So as we know, um, blockchain in the economic sense is basically just uh, an Excel spreadsheet on the internet uh, that you add inflation of 1% or 2% each year and you need per permission to take your money out of it. Yeah? That's basically what a blockchain is. Mm -hmm. So a blockchain is not the optimal uh, st storage of data for all things. It's actually a very suboptimal use for many things. Money is one of the things that it's optimal for. Mm -hmm. I think um, in politics, uh, things like a medical usage or in politics is something that will be extremely uh, a favourable use case. Mm -hmm. If you want to know exactly how many people have been vaccinated across how many clinics, which clinics. Um, you want a database that's going to be updated all at once at every clinic. You want every clinic to know when someone at a clinic a thousand miles away has been vaccinated. So if you're in China and they come across your clinic, you already know. Mm. So a blockchain is useful for that. If it's voting and You've got, uh, as you do in Polynesia, sort of very uh, in 
imprecise uh, boundaries in some cases, imprecise voter registries in some cases. Having a blockchain where you can get a very definitive electoral role on who is uh, allowed to and who's not allowed to vote, and especially if, um, as has occurred in Tonga over the past three elections, some people have voted at three different places. Yeah. Mm. Uh, now, on a paper Excel spreadsheet, even a computerised one, even an online one, you can't tell that automatically. If it's a blockchain and everyone gets updated automatically at the same time, that is a very good use case because once they voted this booth, every other booth in the country knows they can't vote there. So, yeah, 100%. That, that's definitely a use case. Uh, so insofar as my disclaimer at the beginning, not disclaimer, but a caveat that a blockchain isn't an optimal use in all cases, the cases where it is an optimal use it is a very, very outstanding optimal use uh, above uh, all other um, possibilities in that particular realm. Well, that's what I've found anyway. Mm. Uh, when it comes to money, uh, nothing else comes close to having a blockchain in being able to achieve uh, getting rid of the uh, trusted third party and a custodian and getting... Um, a workable decentralized system. It simply cannot be done on any other um, data storage system than uh, a blockchain. Not uh, not in a way to get the results, the desired results that we want. And I believe that's the case uh, for a medical use case as well as for a political and electoral use case. I didn't think I'd end up agreeing with Vitalik Buterin on anything, <laughs> but yeah, I seem to do so <laughs> in cool. this case. <laughs> I found the right uh, passage, the right extract that uh, you could agree on then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was sitting here, as soon as you said Vitalik <laughs> Buterin, I was like, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be very, very interested to see whether there could possibly be one Vitalik quote I might be able to say something in agreement with, and you picked exactly the one <laughs> that was perfect uh, for me to, to agree with. So, yeah, 100%. There you go. All right. Um, my last question uh, for you, and, and thank you already for, for the time you, you gave this podcast. But, my pleasure. Uh, my pleasure. We, we talked about a lot of amazing, uh, inspirational, and, and pretty much game changing tools uh, that are coming in uh, communities in the Pacific. And there's probably people who would listen to this podcast who would like to get involved and maybe use those tools to create economic change, social change, and to really help the Pacific to move forward uh, and towards the future. So for those people listening to you today and see what you about you, you've already accomplished and you're about to continue to accomplish in the coming times, what would be your recommendation? What would be your piece of advice for those people who want to be agent of change in their communities? Um, it's, it sounds cliche and uh, it's very often said, but is the case. Uh, just do it. Just get out there and do it. The, the more you contemplate, the more you discuss, uh, you will find you're just going to end up going round and rounds in circles. Just reach out to the necessary parties that uh, you're going to require to be the conduits to make the changes that are required to implement uh, your plans. Uh, and as we say in Bitcoin, uh, get off zero. So uh, don't stay at zero Bitcoin. Get off zero, make a move uh, forward, mm -hmm. uh, identify as soon as possible, uh, the co-agents of change that you're going to need uh, and uh, consult with them, uh, get yourself a game plan and act immediately. Um, as they say, a trip of a, a thousand steps, a journey of a thousand steps begins with one. So take that first step, mm. uh, get out there, get into uh, the space, uh, both um, 
politically, open that political discourse with decision makers, find and choose allies wisely from both the public and private sector that are going to help you further the cause, uh, get aligned, get all your uh, stars in alignment, as it were, as soon as possible, and make the move. Just thought, just thought, hundred percent. Mm, and definitely believe in the promise of the blockchain and Bitcoin. A hundred percent. This is mm. for, for particularly for people like ours. So Polynesians, there's a reason Polynesians have trouble with traditional legacy financing. Polynesians have trouble with mortgages, uh, paying rent. Tongans especially because Tongans are born with an innate belief that land is f meant to be free mm. because where they come from, land is free. Land's given by God. So everywhere else they go, they expect land to be free. <laughs> but no, people, there are mortgages. Um, and the, the fiat central banking capitalist model is an extractive model. There's a pursuit of profit, but how do you garner that profit? You do so by extracting as much value as you can out of all the natural resources around you, including human beings. It's mm -hmm. an extractive model. Polynesians, uh, that's anathema to our culture. Our cultures are cultures of creating value, of generating value and regenerating value. Uh, things that are, are given um, kudos. Uh, the reason you're a traditional Polynesian chief is because you're the greatest warrior. You could fight and protect your people better than anyone else mm. in the village. You are the best provider. You are the hardest farmer that provided the most food for the people in the village. So when you do for others, our model is... The more you do for others is, in fact, the more you do for yourself. It's leadership by servanthood. Mm. So that is anathema to a fiat central banking capitalist model where it's all about self, self, self. So when Polynesians go, can you teach me to learn this new blockchain technology? I go, no, this is the one that's most naturally aligned with your culture, this should be you going back to the one that's in line with your culture. The decentralized model where everyone in the network has uh, ownership is the way we live. We live communally. We don't live individually. Polynesian and indigenous cultures in the Native American village, they have the talking stick. Whoever holds the stick gets to speak and has a voice in the village affairs whether it's the elder or whether it's a child. In Polynesian communities, we have social hierarchy, but we have functional um, egalitarianism because your role in the community is always that the group is more important, the whole, than any single person. So blockchain fits that perfectly because that's the whole model. It's a decentralized model where uh, all the power is given back to the network. So rather than a central uh, commercial bank validating all our transactions, any one of us who wants to buy an ASIC miner can be a validator and make the money from it. So anyone that wants to have a node gets to vote on the entire course of history of our monetary system. That's what the block size wars proved. Mm. If you can pay $140 to Amazon and buy a Raspberry Pi, you get a vote on the future of Bitcoin just by running a node. You get to uh, sign your own transactions. So this fits perfectly with the Polynesian mm. mode of living, mode of participation, uh, and mode of leadership. So, yeah, it's ideal. I think... Um, that's a takeaway that uh, is not often remembered. That's true. And we'll definitely continue to look at your leadership in uh, leading this uh, revolution in the region. Uh, Lord Fusitua, Maururua, thank you very much for this, uh, this conversation. Oh, it's been an absolute 
Sure. It, it was really uh, inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. And thank you again for the invitation. This was the third and final part of my conversation with Lord Fusitua, and I hope it helped you to reflect on the role and impact the blockchain technology and all the tools that come with it can have in the Pacific. If you haven't listened to the first two parts, you can find them on our Pacific Talks channel on all the podcast platforms. Pacific Talks is a podcast hosted by me, Philip, and produced by Pacific Venture Media. If you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to subscribe on any podcast platform of your choice. You can also share it on your social medias or with your friends, family, or colleagues. And if you listen to it on a podcast platform, feel free to leave us a review. This is very important to us as it helps us to reach out to more people. If you want to share your thoughts and ideas following this conversation, you can reach out to us directly by email, contact at pacificventry.com or on all our social platforms. Until next time with another guest, another discussion on the challenges of the Pacific. Take care and see you soon.